and now everything starts working so for a little bit uh, uh the audio was not there hopefully now everyone can see me and hear me well uh, that's why uh, I, uh, we always test uh, technical things at the start now we can ready or ready to start the lesson huh i i told you guys that i have to check if you can hear me first right all right okay so um we're going to start at the start uh perhaps a little bit of the story and uh, history behind this opening and at first we're going to explore the more classical lines there are quite a few variations that i want to dive into perhaps it's fair to say that it's the most complex opening in chess there are so many variations so many lines and uh I feel like every chess player has to know the basics and the fundamentals of this gorgeous opening uh, even if you're one d4 and one c4 player because as you know ideas in one opening are transitioning to the other openings and so um eventually you will know uh, you will want to know the basics of all of them um hello tudor hello everyone who is just joining i think it's fair to start now and um uh, let's make the moves on the board e4 e5 let's uh, welcome the Ruy Lopez or the Spanish game knight to f3 knight to c6 and we have bishop b5 so this is the point where uh, Ruy Lopez starts uh, perhaps uh, as I said the earliest or one of the earliest openings in chess that we have we know that people uh, hundreds uh, 400 500 years ago were using this opening even the first move e4 makes sense as we're um, very fast with the kingside development and as we all know king safety is the most important element in chess so kingside development makes the king uh, faster to castle and perhaps the idea the most fundamental idea of this move bishop to b5 is to get more control over the square of e5 so perhaps the basic of the basic is that we're trying at some point perhaps under good conditions um, to move uh, away the knight this would be or to capture the knight this would be called an exchange variation and then, uh, then apply the pressure on the black's center there are many ways how black can play here we're going to uh, today look at two main lines a6 and also the so-called berlin variation with the knight to f6 now um those of you who have never seen uh, Rui Lopez before I doubt there are such people but perhaps someone like I did as well I started with the opening 1d4 as an, a beginner and it it, it it take me years actually to start looking at e4 and they may be questioning uh, something that is obvious to um, most of you who play Rui Lopez why cannot white just win the pawn by capturing the knight and subsequently taking the pawn on e5 so the the basic tactic is that after um, bishop takes c6 uh, black wouldn't take with the pawn and of course after knight takes e5 there are many double attacks but um, one of them is queen d4 one black is double attacking the knight on e, uh, on e5 and the pawn on e4 and so black gets the pawn back plus has a good position so however that doesn't mean that uh, taking on c6 doesn't have any kind of advantages uh good night surya uh apologies for all of you if i cannot pronounce your name properly uh my bad uh i i should uh, at some point learn more of uh, asian names and how to pronounce them um good evening to all of you uh, so taking on c6 is uh uh, one of the moves it's called the exchange variation of the Rui Lopez uh, but it aims not to win the pawn on e5 so I'll be asking you guys uh, if um, any of you can help me out and tell me what's the main idea for white uh, in this exchange variation why at all uh, would white be taking on c6 and giving up a bishop for a knight what's the main idea in this opening Good night, Popovich. Uh, I'm so, so happy that there are people from all over the place. This one, I'm pretty sure I pronounced correctly. Let me know, right? Popovich, right? That sounds European. Um, I, as a Lithuania, know that there are many battles in basketball between our countries. Um, 
And so Serbian names are very easy for me to pronounce as I know many basketball players from Serbia. All right, so regarding the opening, um, some of you guessed uh, one idea, the others pointed out the correct answer. And the most fundamental idea of whites is to really just to create the majority on the king side of four versus three. Let me illustrate that. There are there is an odd move d4 which we're going to see in the game. We're going to follow a very famous game, Lasker versus Capablanca. Uh, nowadays people tend to castle where we'll take a look at that as well. But um, let's just make the moves on the board. d4 uh, takes, takes, queen takes d4 and knight takes d4. And we have a pawn structure where we have four. Let me highlight those squares. Here we go, four versus three on the king side, which promises us good prospect of creating a pass pawn on the king side in the end game. So black is not able to respond uh, with similar ideas on the on the queen side because his pawns are doubled. So at the very fundamental level, uh, white has higher chances of uh, of getting a pass pawn, and so that's his main idea. Although black has huge compensation, one of them is uh, uh, the bishop pair. Also, black will be able to put a solid position in the center and control it well, and this is super solid for uh, black as well. Now, before we dive into this old game, that is must know game, must know game, absolutely. Let's take a look at nowadays theory. And after castles here, um, white is first castling and then playing d4. Black has a couple of options, but I just want to make a move f6. And this is the main move in this position, or one of the main moves in this position. And who told you not to ever touch the f-pawn, right? Now, I like to always teach my students this way, that I'm explaining them uh, why a certain move is good or bad in a certain situation, so that later they would know both the principle and the exception. It is true that most of the times touching the f-pawn um, is not a good idea in the e4, e5 openings, but here we have an exception. Um, sorry, uh, yes. So... The point is this, that uh, white doesn't have the light square bishop. And so by weakening these light squares around the king, uh, black has absolutely no worries because he's going to put the light square bishop on e6. So because the bishop is coming to e6 and those light square weaknesses that black has created with the pawn move to f6 will be covered, uh, white, on the other hand, doesn't have the light square bishop to damage uh, those or weaken those uh, squares even further. Black is absolutely fine. However, more interesting move as well would be bishop to g4, which creates a very interesting variation here that is possible for black. It's natural to want to kick the bishop out with h3, and now black has an amazing idea, which those players of Teru Lopez, of course, know, but those who don't enjoy the move h5. Uh, yes, so I, I see that most of you even say the move h5 before uh, I put it on the board. Very nice that we have Rui Lopez uh, players in the chat. So the basic idea is that we cannot take because we're gonna get almost mated here. The knight cannot move because queen h4 and queen h1 is going to be mate. And so black is going to regain the piece by taking on f3 and this is already bad for white now an easy way for us to get out of this since we're more aiming this um, opening repertoire on the from the white's perspective although i don't advocate for exchange variation of the real lopez i'm just showing you variations showing you cards and you will be the one that will take the decision uh, which variation to play but we play d3 and uh, black is going to increase the pressure on the f3 knight and here i recommend the move bishop e3 the most simplest now uh the point is this that i'm threatening knight d2 with a perfect development when you cannot do, do anything uh, the other line was of course knight bd2 which is even slightly perhaps more popular but now the bishop stays on c1 with bishop to e3 if black wants uh well 
easy quality perhaps uh, at least that's what most of the people play they just go for an end game so they're relieving relieving the tension and we have this bam 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 end game which i think is slightly more comfortable to play with white if you know your plans so uh white is threatening here to play f4 to undouble their pawns so that's an idea you must be aware of as well for white if you uh, want to play the exchange variation and after bishop d6 we're simply gonna play knight d2 uh, we have cool a uh, square on c4 that is waiting for us and after knight e7 a move that is not very uh, intuitive we play rook f to b1 with ideas of playing b4 b5 a4 and trying to open up the files for our rooks so this is uh, one of the plans that I would recommend and you're getting out of all those messy variations that could arise if we play knight bd2 here, right? So perhaps this could be our uh, repertoire over here. Now let's go back and I want to show you the game of the exchange variation if that's what you want to play. Uh, again, castling is the go-to move in the main line. But why don't we uh, look at the end game and see what is happening after white is playing d4. We have Lasker versus Capablanca here. Takes, 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 bishop to d6. Black is controlling the center, um, uh, controlling the e5 square. Um, that's where in general later perhaps white wants to create a pass pawn, right? Uh, since the e pawn is the one that is the so-called candidate pass pawn black doesn't have the e pawn perhaps that's where he will want to push and as we learned a minute ago white's main plan in that game is going to be uh, creating a pass pawn on the king side which black is not able to respond to on the queen side because of the double pawns um if uh, your opponent has a bishop pair it's almost always a good idea to exchange of the bishops so if uh, everything is status quo, all other things are equal, white would be happy to exchange the dark square bishops. So we have knight to c3 on the board, knight to e7, castles, and now Capablanca decided to castle. Hello, someone is asking, uh, maybe you were, uh, if they were missing the videos, maybe perhaps, but I'm welcoming you and uh, I hope I will do my best today to to teach you about uh, about the Rui and uh, I will be waiting for you on the next uh, video of mine as well please uh, don't be shy everyone use me as your chess coach today um, ask anything related to chess I would also appreciate a lot if you could put a like on this video that really means a lot to me and uh, then it means that what I do matters for you so uh, one of the most popular just say moves that uh, of course black would also play in these structures would be c5 with the idea of uh, creating this uh, c6 uh, square for the knight now where to retreat the knight is the question for white so just remember this idea that if you can knight e2 followed by bishop f4 is a good idea for white if your opponent has a bishop pair exchange one of the bishops it's a little bit more comfortable already to play for white uh, than it was a, a, a moment ago black is absolutely fine white is fine i think that both players are nearly find it equal but uh, of course white still has this long-term plan of creating a pass pawn on the king side so in the game kappa castled uh, white plays f4 and creates this so-called mobile center already mobile center has potential to move in the middle game with queens on the board we would want to push create space advantage restrict opponent's pieces and follow that up with a kingside attack whereas really in the in the end game it's just to create a pass pawn so for example if the pawn is on f6 we push takes takes voila we have a pass pawn and that's this another strength of the mobile pawns Uh, thank you for everyone who is saying uh, hello everyone and uh, someone is saying that uh, I was helping them with the London system thank you very much it means a world to me if I can improve your chess um, I'm very happy and I'm very satisfied with this compliment thank you very much so in, in this game we had Capablanca playing rook e8 really uh, one of there are a couple of ways how to uh, play against the mobile center as black and in, in general <laughs> even if you're white but you want to attack it or and undermine it or and block it 
So basically, playing on the flank against the mobile pawns almost never work. Like really, uh, that's a terrible idea in any kind of mobile pawn structure. Uh, black needs to put pressure on e4 or try to undermine it. Uh, by exchanging the pawns or blocking the white center pretty much so rook e8 makes sense now we had knight to b3 uh, be careful about ideas like e5 uh, you're advancing the pawns but creating a lot of weak squares so after bishop b4 say knight e4 knight f5 already these pawns are blocked uh, black has good grip on e6 f5 pawns uh, pawns uh, on f e6 f5 squares the pawns are really blocked and we don't have much of the movement black is absolutely fine this is a, a perfect example of how to go wrong with the mobile pawns you don't have any benefits out of it or they don't outweigh the, the negatives so we had knight b3 f6 and now black wants to play <clears throat> knight g6 so that whenever white plays f5 knight could comfortably block the position on e5 and here white emmanuel lasker the world champion uh played a huge move that uh, shocked the world um because it has nothing to do with the main plan of this exchange variation of the Rui lopez which is really just as i mentioned uh, creating a majority of the pawns on the king side and creating a pass pawn and drilling it slowly uh, this end game uh, so white played the move f5 let's let's questioning that move let's question that what are the benefits and the negatives out of uh, that move so let me pinpoint first uh, the benefits so a first of all perhaps not the most important but we're taking away the square on g6 from the knight right two we're creating an outpost on e6 so that let's say at some point we could be placing the knight on e6 please take uh, take a note e4 is the backward pawn so ideally perhaps black would want the bishop on b7 so that he could target this e4 weakness right so then we have this at some point maybe idea knight d4 knight e6 third uh, white can now play bishop f4 exchanging the bishop is almost always a good idea if your opponent has a bishop pair and and so um these are main benefits negatives we take uh, we uh get e5 squares black the question is how fast and if the knight can get there of course maybe there there are ways but how fast and in each variation right uh, lasker thought that the benefits outweighed the negatives so we had bishop uh, i'm so, sorry pawn to b6 here but capablanca bishop to f4 so Lasker understood that rule uh, more than a hundred years ago before all of us were born to exchange the bishop is a good idea and the world champion the great talent one of the most talented players of all time didn't have the access to all the information today and we're good only because we have learned from those uh, previous chess gods but Kappa made a mistake here and Capablanca played a move that at least to my student seems to be the most natural he played bishop to b7 why would i not want y to take here as black if i'm undoubling my pawns is the question right well because the d6 pawn first of all is going to be weak right i'm going to play rook d1 it's going to be backward and if you can't get d5 that pawn is gonna be a weakness right now, if I take, for example, instead, rook takes, and I play c5, now, the e4 pawn is weak, the rook on f4 is misplaced, it's really awkward, black is going to put the bishop on b7, play knight c6, knight e5, and maybe, if the center is blocked, we could already pursue a queenside majority attack to restrict the pieces even further. So, that, these are the, the thoughts, and this was the conclusion after the analysis, However, Capablanca played bishop to b7. So now we had takes and takes, and the pawn on d6 is backward. Right? So now we can apply pressure on it. Not only that, uh, perhaps the other benefit that I should point pinpoint of this that our knight now cannot go to e6, right? Because c5 pawn is here. Bishop b7 next, and that's really good. In the game, bishop b7. Takes, takes, c bishop b7 ah i have to click on it okay bishop takes d6 takes and now we have knight d4 
So not only d6 pawn, you on double that, but it's weak, right? Is going to be under attack, but also knight is getting to e6. So rook a to d8, knight e6, and this position is already bad for uh, Mr. Capablanca. Um, I'm welcoming all the questions about the, the position. If you have about the opening or any kind of chess related questions, um, I will be thankful if all of those who uh, just came to the chat would uh, put a like as well on this video. Thank you very much. That means a lot to me. And uh, perhaps we can continue with this uh, amazing game that is one of the most famous games of all time. And we're going to see a classical uh, play based on one rule that I don't want to just mention because it would spoil the answer. I will want to give you an exercise very soon. So for now, let's just enjoy how uh, Emmanuel Lasker uh, gets the advantage by creating initiative against the d6 pawn. Um, as you see already, the knights have to be passive. Knight c8, not good. Rook f2 just piling up versus d6. Very easy game. b5, rook fd2, rook d7. Again, I like the next move of whites a lot. b4, uh, just making sure we fix the pawns on the light squares. Bishop on b7 is not good. No dreams of playing a5, c5s. For now, king to f7. White is just improving the position and improving the position and now he says i dominate the center so i want to teach you perhaps the most important principle in chess at least when it comes to middle game strategy what do we do dear citizens of earth when we have an advantage in the center what should be the white plan here what do we do when we have advantage in the center already we dominate the center exactly so two uh two three many people are correct when you have dominance over the center or center is blocked we move the play to the flank so here white is absolutely dominating the center like look at their pieces around the center right so now white just goes g4 and king side attack right so Perhaps we could play moves like later without allowing, just don't allow any breaks, right? Counterplay, because if you switch everything to the king side, please take control of the center as well. Don't allow counterplay there. But if if we can write something like g5, I mean, opening it up with ideas of placing rook on g7 should be a kill. So we can just now see how white attacks on the king side moves the play to there. And pretty much Capablanca had no chance to... To stop it so lasker opens up the h file moves the rooks there and now makes another gorgeous marvelous move e5 getting the knight to e4 oh dear what is going on right just perfect pieces rooks are an open file penetrating to the seven knight e6 knight e4 perfect squares for the knight game is over basically right and kappa soon resigned so this is the classical game in this um, Rui Lopez variation. Now, more of Rui Lopez, right? Now, um, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5. So now in this, uh, in this part of the video or the stream, we will be viewing at perhaps nowadays the main defense as black against uh, Rui Lopez. It wasn't so popular back in the day. It was popularized by Mr. Vladimir Kramnik, the great world champion from Russia, who beat Garry Kasparov in the world championship match and became the world champion. And uh, this was a defense that he used against E4. So the Berlin defense. Now, it is famous for an end game. Of course, nowadays people also play the play a variation called Ante Berlin. So let's explore that. Uh, white castles and uh, black takes the pawn on e4 just because they can. And here white decides to open up the position as black grabbed that pawn. And it is time to open things up uh, as long as the black's king is in the middle. So 
why black uh, didn't play a6 so that now after knight d6 the bishop would get hit you could imagine that if say a6 bishop a4 were included knight couldn't go to d6 uh, and hit the bishop and now white would have an alternative move like say takes on e5 and and, and with a good position so here uh white takes on c6 um black takes on c6 d takes e5 again very forced line um knight pretty much has to go to f5 if knight e4 white can keep the queens on the board and uh, here middle game is just better for white rook on d1 black's king is in the middle we have space advantage with the pawn e5 development is good so black goes knight f5 and here we have this end game of the berlin the most famous uh end game perhaps uh that arise out of the openings um the question is, is Berlin bad for beginners? Every beginner, I believe, is different. And um, there are many, many opinions. And uh, I just found that, find that there is no good answer with regards to which opening is good for a beginner, which opening is bad for beginners. So uh, when I teach beginners, of course, I, I give them a solid repertoire. And it depends if you want short-term success or long-term success. So if a student uh, wants good results in the next two months, you can teach them uh, more weird sidelines. Like for example, with white, you can teach them pseudo-Catalan, same London, for example, and they get good solid positions with white. With black, you can also teach them more easier openings to play. Um, or if you go for long-term results, if you have a kid that really wants to uh, be serious about chess or and you want to grow a champion then in the long term we can already start learning uh, main lines so why don't we play e4 e5 or e4 c5 and or d4 as uh, as white in the short term yes they're very hard and people might be losing the games because there are traps and all that but in the long term after a year your whole understanding position understanding of chess because boost and is far far better than those who play those simple openings it's just because the openings are far more rich and uh, i also hold an opinion that every 200 rating points a player must introduce into his repertoire a new opening so if say you're 1200 uh, i teach you an opening for white opening for black after 200 rating points once you become i said 1200 so when you become 1400 one new opening for white or variation one new opening for black so that when you get to like 2200 you could play against e4 like two systems three openings already with couple of variations so you could play e5 french and say sicilian right uh, not to the same level but right some maybe weirder lines and some of the openings right because you don't want to be playing one opening a uh, whole your life that was, I hope, comprehensive answer to that question. So, what what is going on in this end game, right? And let's just get the fundamentals here. So, first of all, let's say white's advantages and black's advantages. One, white has a healthy pawn majority on on the king side, and chances to create a pass pawn. So, one, two, three, right? same as exchange french and black is not able to respond with the same so if i take all the pieces away except the kings white is winning right uh, or at least it should be like that right so white can create a pass pawn now two and this is the most important perhaps uh, black's king is misplaced and doesn't allow the rooks to be connected easily so the real problem in the berlin for black is just not that the king itself is weak but that the king is misplaced So um, the, now the third advantage for white would be that white leads the development, right? So white is going gonna go first out of uh, out of the back rank, and so we could say that moves like knight c3, rook d1 starts leading the development for white. Perhaps the the, the pawn on e5 gives us space advantage as well. Now black's advantages. Now we should mention that black has a bishop pair. Although black always, 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 always wants to exchange the, the dark square bishop on one of the opponent's knights. Because 
if say I would exchange the uh, dark square bishop for the opponent's knight on say b1 I could set up a blockade on the light squares on the king side so remember that majority that I said we want to create a pass pawn right um, if the one of the knights gets exchanged I could easily put the pawn on g6 and have these light squares under my control and it's almost impossible to create a pass pawn or it's very hard to do so uh, on the king side so we always want to exchange the dark square bishop for the knight also we would love to play any kind of end game as black against this bishop so don't allow easily uh, to swap uh, this uh, knight of yours if you are playing white for uh, uh, for the dark square bishop now e5 pawn another problem for white is that e5 pawn is weak and it is really a burden more than an asset the, it really hangs a lot of the times and it blocks the dark square bishop the more pawn goes back actually here the better white is more okay on any of these squares so if i put the pawn on e2 this endgame is much better for white because uh, then I can play bishop f4, I have good diagonal, perhaps the pawn should really go to e4, and so e5 pawn is not the most, uh, the best one here. So let's take a look at a couple of games over here. And all of you who, who just came, again, I would appreciate if you can put a like on this video. Thank you so much for... Uh, for showing in the chat and asking questions. I appreciate that a lot, my friends. So let's take a look at a game how white won. And then we will also look at the game how black won. So we have e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, shift to b5, and Berlin. So d4, knight takes e4, castles, a little bit weirder move order. Um, people castle here more commonly. So we have, because d4 allows these all sort of knight takes d4s, so it just white messed up a little bit with the move order, but we're still getting to the Berlin. By the way, we're seeing a game from Kostanyuk, Grandmaster from Russia, against, um, against another very strong female player, Ambar Tsumova. So knight takes e4, castles, all what we have seen before takes on c6 now there was a question why can't we take uh, b takes c6 uh, this position is just very good for white so we play rook e1 just we lead the development we have huge space advantage with the pawn on e5 uh, your king is not going to be safe on the king side because i restrict already your pieces there um, not so easy for black to either undermine as well the the uh, the pawn on e5 without having any kind of problems and so this is just considered uh, very very strong for white so we're getting to the berlin king takes king take uh, queen takes king takes and now we have rook d1 usually people play knight c3 it's the most uh universal move that doesn't show off any cards but although i think rook d1 is the most natural we're just putting the rook on the open file Yes, uh, everyone everyone who um, is a little bit late, uh, they can always, you can always watch the video afterwards. It's going to be on Chess24. Don't you worry, all right? I'm referring to Anikat. By the way, thank you so much for, uh, for letting me know. So, king to e8, knight to c3, bishop to e7, and slowly we're going to see the main plants of whites. Of creating this uh, majority on the king side so how does the game look like if things go well for white so knight to e4 just centralizing the knight um, tempi don't matter in perhaps so much in 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 such more of a closed positions h6 um not at like just covering g5 at some point especially if bishop comes to e6 maybe at some point if bishop wasn't on e7 we could play knight g5 remember that black wants to exchange the dark square bishop for the knight don't do that as white don't allow uh dark square bishop exchange for any of your knights because black will set up a huge blockade on these light squares and you won't get a pass pawn or it's gonna be hard so we have b3 most of the time bishop goes to b2 you will have to uh protect uh, the pawn on e5 it's gonna be a, a little bit hanging a lot of the times bishop to e6 bishop to b2 and rook to d8 now those of you who might question if if we can take as white i think that after taking we're helping black as 
where he can place now the king on c8 and so black solved main problem of theirs which is just the misplaced king and now i don't even think we need the rook on d8 because uh, rook is already good on the on the perhaps the h file if we push the pawns but of course we could consider it at at some point as well so we have h3 slowly preparing uh, ideas with g4 uh, she will want to put uh, push the pawn majorities a b6 and we have pawn to c4 so usually the best pawn structure in the in the berlin for black would be with uh, on the queen side with the pawns on the dark squares uh, you want to make the light square bishop a monster and the ideal placement for the king would be on c6 so if you could achieve that uh, those pawn that pawn structure and king on c6 you're mwah, perfect uh, but uh, of course c5 sometimes weaken this d5 square and that's why white plays this c4 they want to have a grip on that square so a5 g4 majority starts rolling knight to h4 knights could be exchanged no worries there and f4 so here like majority starts rolling and that pass pawn is going to be created so Kostanyuk plays it very well so already say if g6 trying to stop the ideas of f5 we could like, swap the rooks and then play rook f1 with the next move f5 and majority starts rolling so in the game we had bishop to c8 a little bit passive and white played a gorgeous move e6 so making sense of this diagonal and taking uh attacking g7 so black pretty much has to play something like king f8 and now white plays an amazing move uh, I, I enjoyed it so much the move g5 so the point is that the bishop is closed and no longer defends uh, the pawn on d8 hello shuvo nice to see you here again uh thank you very much for coming and uh, and so the bishop is no longer uh, defending this d8 uh, d8 rock so that forces the rook either to take or to move away and now amazing move knight to f6 what is happening right so the idea is that when when it happened that after takes we have bishop to f6 and we're threatening e7 so that's not good e7 rook d8 mamma mia right what is happening Kostanyuk is playing so well so we had rook h7 e7 and uh, black had to take and then with the finishing kill rook d8 rook e8 rook d1 and soon mate is about to come so king is already in the box so in the game we had bishop d7 rook d7 and white won so this is what happens when things go uh, good for white now let's take a look at the game where things are going bad for black uh, for white so this is going to be uh, the uh, the berlin uh, let's look at it perhaps from uh, black's point of view because it's important to know your opening from both colors so if you play berlin for uh, for white uh, if you're e4 player and you play Rui lopez you have to know the basic ideas for black as well so let's reach the berlin via normal move order this time and this time we play knight c3 as white so black is going to demolish uh, white here uh, the player with the black pieces is very talented dutch player ervil el ami uh, i'm pretty sure my pronunciation was terrible apologies again um not very good with the uh with the names and uh black here plays 97 so a very weird looking move um but the point of this move is to get the knight to g6 and apply pressure on e5 so this uh make sure that the white knight for now has to stay on f3 and so it makes it hard for white to achieve his main plan which is just to push the majority right so we place the knight on g6 h3 knight g6 and now this knight for now cannot move and allow f4 so knight to e4 and black plays h6 so um now if we play bishop to e6 the problem is that you cannot lose that light square bishop uh, knight to g come is uh, knight to g5 is gonna come and so we're gonna have problems like you cannot lose the light square bishop in the berlin or that's uh, the principle not all the time again but you want to preserve it that's your bet piece and you always want to exchange the dark square bishop for the knight right so if you can dark square bishop swap it whenever you can as white don't allow that 
So black plays h6, we have b3 as white, and now c5. So uh, because the knight is now on e4 and not on c3, um, c5, weakening the d5 square has no drawbacks. If the knight was, say, on c3, it could jump to d5 now. And remember, on the queen side, c6 is not what you want to play. Your placement of the pawns is on the dark squares with ideally the king on c6. All right, so white plays c4, um, bishop to e6, bishop to b2, and king to d7. So the, the king is just coming to c6 where it's most comfortable, rook to d1, king to c6, knight c3 trying to fight for d5, bishop to e7, knight to d5, and now a5. So basically if white takes on e7 we know that they cannot exchange the the dark square bishop of blacks that's always a very good idea for uh for black so we're not uh hesitating to prevent that knight h2 perhaps white wants to go for their main plan of pushing on the king side rook h to d8 exchanging the dark square bishop what we had uh what we shouldn't do a4, uh, playing on the queen side, already pawns are a little bit weaker, bishop to f5, and already white is getting completely outplayed. There is no harmony in white's pieces, they're all over the place, uh, majority hasn't been pushed, black got everything he wanted. He maintained the light square bishop, he achieved his perfect setup uh, with, say, okay, pawn could go to b6, on the dark squares on the queen side, king is on c6, rooks are connected, rooks are playing, and this is just terrible thing uh, position for white. So they tried even e6. Black didn't take it. Uh, I guess the idea is that they're opening up the, the bishop and attack on g7. So f6, rook d1, and uh, white just resigned. So this is how things could go very good for black. And as you can see, Berlin could be played for the win as well. For those who, are, who just came, I would appreciate if you can put a like on this video. Thank you very much. And uh, we can uh, pursue uh, with new ideas. And now I want to show you a different type of Rui Lopez, uh, which is going to be um, the closed one. Let me find number eight. And here we have a structure of the closed Rui Lopez. Perhaps we can show you how we get there as well. We have e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, and another move that black can play, which is the main line, a6. So this is already not the Berlin territory. Bishop to a4, knight to f6, and um, white is willing to leave that pawn over there. If black was to take here, we would call this open, open uh, Spanish, and white will be able to give get the pawn back with ideas similarly with d4 and rook e1. So the main line of the Rui Lopez goes with bishop to e7, rook to e1. Now white is defending the pawn on e4, b5, bishop to b3, d6, c3. White always goes for his main ideas with d4. And if whenever we can, we're gonna go for d4. Hello, Jafar. Hello, um, Kakalari, if I pronounce that well. Uh, welcome, everyone. Nice to see you again. How are you guys? Uh, we're exploring the Rui Lopez, the closed variation right now. So, black castles, white plays h3 to prevent bishop g4. And, uh, in these positions, black has uh, many moves to choose from. Um, there are a couple of variations that uh, they could go for. Um, there are basically three main lines in um, in the Rui Lopez. Um, and those are knight a5, bishop b7, and just the classical knight b8. Don't know exactly which are classical one, but all of these has drawbacks and has benefits to it. Um, perhaps the move to a5 prepares pawn move to c5. If we have time, we're going to explore on that. 
the move knight to b8 prepares a solid knight bd7 when black will be able to apply the pressure on e4 knight is not gonna be in the bishop's way and black can also play the pawn to c5 and perhaps the, uh, the, the, the other variation would be bishop to b7 directly applying the pressure on e4. So I hope we can look at all of these, but uh, we'll see how time allows us that. So the question is why they play b5 instead of castles. Perhaps it's important to know that whenever white defends the pawn on e4, uh, with anyway, queen e2 or uh, pawn to d3, they're already threatening to win the pawn on e5. So for example, castles, takes, takes, and you don't have any tactics because these already, okay, the pawn on e4 is protected. So you'd have no way to win it back. So basically, whenever white defends the pawn, say queen e2, you play b5 and d6, right? So that you, they wouldn't have that tactic, or d3, right? So again, b5 or and d6. Because if, if you don't, then you're going to be losing a pawn over there. Hopefully that answers the question. Hello, Raunak. Thank you very much for, for stopping by. Nice to see you too. Uh, dear people, please ask any kind of chess-related questions. A use measure chess coach. I will gladly stop and answer uh, the most important ones. So I want to just show you the main idea uh, in the Ruy Lopez, or one of the main ideas. It's going to be related to the knight maneuver, which all of you who play this opening are familiar with, but others might be not. And it's the idea of bringing the knight to g3. So knight d2, knight f1, knight g3 is very common. Uh, the idea is to support the pawn on e4, and also sometimes peak at the square of f5 in case the bishop is on b7. And this is one of the reasons why black a lot of the times places the pawn on the square on g6. So we're going to see a very interesting game um, uh, in, the, in, in similar variation. Let me find uh, mo uh, game 10. It's going to be Robert James Bobby Fischer versus Boris Pasky in 1992 when they played the rematch. So Bobby wasn't playing the chess for 20 years, Bobby Fischer of course, and, um, and he played the, one of the most brilliant games that anyone has ever played. So we have e4, e5, let's go from the start. All of these moves that we looked at before, if you have questions, please stop and don't hesitate to ask. So, all the moves were already explored, b5, bishop b3, and I'm going to show you another idea that is very common in these lines. c3, white wants to break with d4. By the way, c3 also uh, leaves the point, spot for the bishop to go to c2, because knight e5, you don't want to lose the Rui bishop. Don't lose the Rui Lopez bishop, right? The bishop uh, that is the light square is very important to us. So, castles, h3, stopping bishop g4. An important inclusion and black goes knight b8 a weird looking move but it has a lot of benefits um, the main idea is to get the knight to d7 and black is trying to put the bishop now on the b7 square uh, where we're gonna apply the pressure on the e4 pawn this wasn't possible with the knight on c6 white on the other hand rushes with this maneuver of getting the knight to g3 and uh, fulfilling his opening dream of protecting e4 like that and perhaps even aiming at the f5 square. So knight bd2, bishop to b7. And for now, we're preventing knight f1, knight g3 because e4 is hanging. So now Mr. Rui Bishop has to go to c2, which is a small win for black maybe, right? And then we can play knight f1, knight g3. So now black plays rook e8. Already indirectly, right? Staring at that pawn on e4. So white plays knight f1. Bishop to f8. Which variation of the Rui Lopez is best for white? Sasmit is uh, asking us a question. Uh, there is no best variation, good or bad. Uh, everyone is uh, choosing the variation that uh, they understand the most or that the variation would fit their style. The way I would do, if I was your coach, is I would show you all of the variations in Rui Lopez, like three main lines, and then I would show you games and explain you the main ideas behind it. 
And then you would be telling me which one do you like the most? What is your feeling for it and would fit your style or which has the most clear plans according to you? So if one player, uh, if one variation fits one player better, then others might be playing uh, King's Gambit all the time, right? Because <laughs> uh, they have met, like very fighting character and they're chaotic in, in, in their lives. I remember Gary used to say that... Uh, our natural real life character resembles uh, our character as a chess player as well. So if you're very calm as a chess player, then you're supposed to be calm also in the in the chess game. But uh, I would ask then, what about Steinitz, who was almost in the wheelchair? Maybe they didn't have wheelchairs at that time. I don't know, but uh, had very bad health. But how did he play on the board? He was attacking, he wasn't backing down at all. But perhaps it has nothing to do with his character, it's just that physical health was not the best, right? So, thanks Samuel for question. The, the question is, uh, why white wouldn't be playing uh, d5 after bishop to b7? Let's go there. So, I have to say that in general, uh, d5 is a structure that we want to go for as white, especially if the pawn is on c5. Now, the reason why we sometimes are resistant to the idea of d5 in these situations, because there is a very common pawn break, c6. And that's why black didn't play c5, right? So this is perfect now situation for black to be playing that. And now black gets good control over d5. And he's gonna play knight c5. I apply the pressure on e4. That's going to be huge. Plus, if he gets d5, he should be even better, right? So the problem and how to evaluate this position is first, who claims the d5 square? How much of a pressure there is on e4? And if black can play d5. So thank you for the question. I hope that answers Samuel Smith. And I'm welcoming everyone to, uh, to ask questions and also put a like on the video. You wouldn't believe how much, um, it, it, how much I care about that. That really shows me that you enjoyed the lesson. So uh, this is the reason, I guess, why d5 is not played so early, right? However, after the pawn on c5, if we play d5, they don't have that same break, right, Samuel? So... <clears throat> Bobby Fischer uh, versus Paskey here, knight f1, bishop f8, knight g3, and because the bishop is already not here, uh, we're kind of threatening to go f5, even after like a move like uh, g6. Um, black uh, isn't really weakening the dark square so severely because the dark square bishop is simply there. So black just plays this as a prophylaxis, taking away the f5 square, and white goes bishop g5 developing a piece. White in this situation. Uh, hello Pavan Kumar, nice to see you here. Um, so white in this position really would love to play queen d2 and bishop h6 and follow that up with a kingside attack if you could, right? So black plays like, it like skips a move, let's just skip a move for black, although it's very hard to do it here, right? Uh, bishop h6 would be one of the ideas. Not the, sorry, 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 not here. Queen d2 first, right? And then bishop h6 is one of the ideas um, that white would want to do. So black doesn't allow any dreams of that. h6, bishop comes back to d2 so that the pawn would still be uh, overprotected and the e-file would be still open to the rook or semi-opened. Okay, it's closed, but rooks, I guess, doesn't want to be blocked. Because uh, black can always open it up and there is going to be a huge pressure on e4. So that's something that we have to overprotect. So bishop to g7 solidifying the king side and now i'm going to show you the other idea that is super important for any Rui player um one was this one and that one is a4 very standard uh, white both applies pressure on b5 and at some point at some point not now at some point plays on the a file so we could even sometimes triple up here behind um, and then open it up so that we could invade the a7 track You're welcome, Sukhrit Das. Thank you for your compliment. Uh, someone is asking how to improve the rating. Well, I think there is no shortcut. It's just doing a little bit of everything. So it, it means tactics, strategy, um, and game analysis, all of those components, right? It, it is a, a package of, of things that one has to do to get to 1500. 
uh, I would ask you this in order to answer your question. How did you get to 1400, right? So maybe doing the same things, but more efficiently or better, or just doing same things. And perhaps we could uh, uh, make you a 1500 already, right? Because you were doing some things that brought you to that rating already. So now we played C5 and Samuel, uh, just see what white does now. Black plays c5 and now we play d5, right? So he doesn't have that break uh, c6 anymore. We know you're 2100, you're very high rated. But I don't know your name. Uh, but thank you very much for being in all of our streams and so active. You're a very strong player. So here, black plays c4, which the main idea is that we can get the knight to c5 and apply the pressure on e4. So white plays b4, a typical idea, taking away the c5 square. Now we have knight to h7. So perhaps this move is a little bit awkward, but black at some point would want to go maybe for ideas uh, of pawn breaks, uh, pawn pushes on the king side. Somehow f5, h5, h4, right? Because if white is playing already with a4 on the queen side, right? And the center is blocked. The only place for black to play is on the king side, right? Do opening matter uh, for lowering the 2000? So Saul is asking. I think that um, opening matters at all stages, but perhaps when you're a beginner, then uh, it, it more matters to play the opening wealth than to know the opening theory. But openings do matter at every point. It's just that... Opening theory starts mattering more as you climb, but it matters since you're uh, LO1, right? So, yes. So, we have bishop to e3, very nice move that uh, aims at these diagonals. Uh, this diagonal, now, we don't have to um, unblock the rook on e1 to overprotect e4. e4 is not hanging to us at all. And now, Spassky plays h5, queen d2 developing. Rook f8. And here comes what I wanted to show you. Right? Why a4 is so cool. Bobby is going to show us why. Bobby Fisher, of course. Or Robert James Fisher. Rook a3. White is trying to triple or double on the a file. And then open it up. So ideal. Queen a2. Rook a1. Swap. And then we can get the rook to a7. And that's power, right? So the point of open file is so that we could invade the 7th or any other dangerous ranks, right? For all the, of the, you who just joined, if you can and enjoy the video, please put a like on the video. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question by Anna. Why doesn't uh, black take uh, M Passant after b4? That is a very interesting uh, question, and the answer is that they do take. So this is the main line. Uh, Spassky was the one who did not take. So we would have something like, I imagine, knight to c5, and we could maybe solidify the center as white with c4, slight pressure on b5, but this is the go-to move for black. So your idea is a grandmaster idea, Anna. Congratulations. So we had rook a3 on the board, Knight d to f6 and just doubling up on the a file. So not only that, Bobby is uh, tripling up. And I guess black uh, just didn't find a convincing way at some point to push the pawns on the king side. He just didn't see anything going there where well. So with queen e8 and all of these uh, moves, what black really is aiming for is overprotecting a8. So that after open up of the a file, uh, this rook wouldn't be lost. Why not bishop h6? I guess because white is already playing on the a-file right now. Although Bobby is going to transition to the king side as well. Real Lopez is one of the openings where we're playing on all parts of the boards. But um, uh, I guess for now Bobby is focusing on the a-file. Plus, sometimes you have this idea of temporary blocking the file if you cannot win it. And placing the bishop on a7 and doubling, tripling behind it. But now you already doubled, so you don't need that. Um, and I think that in general, uh, this bishop is good and this bishop is bad. So unless we follow up bishop h6 with a kingside attack, uh, then uh, there is no point in exchanging them. So we have knight f1, which is genius idea. Uh, he wants to open it up, 
then bring the knight where it aims at b5. Ridiculous, right? <laughs> Genius Bobby Fischer. So bishop to e7, knight d2, king g7, knight b1. Now imagine black keeps waiting. Watch this, right? So we open it up, right? We take, 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 and knight a3 win the pawn and win the game. So what a genius idea, like bringing back the knight in a closed position um, from g3. So at first it went d2, f1, g3, then it went back, f1, d2, g1, right? So here, uh, Spassky took on e4, uh, bishop takes e4, f5 with uh, forks, bishop to c2, trying to create counterplay, uh, getting two pawns for the piece right now. And Bobby just didn't have it. Rook a7 and went to win the game. So already this position I think is, uh, is enough to explain you the idea of the... Or a couple of ideas that are very popular in the Rui Lopez. And the rest is just a good middle game lesson that we could have. But since today's topic is the Rui Lopez, it's fair to, to end here. Thank you very much. Um, we didn't have enough time to watch the open Rui Lopez, but I'm sure that uh, uh, you can analyze some of it on your own. Uh, I have to thank you for such a big audience that was so active today. Um, I hope to see you on Friday. Please come. I, I will be streaming uh, the French defense. Uh, popper opening for black uh, let's learn together i really enjoy preparing for these streams i know uh, that uh, so so many of you also come here and ask me questions it's really a pleasure to be working with you guys um, thank you so much for watching i appreciate for all the likes that you put on this video that means really a world to me thank you very much um, and uh, see you on friday all right my friends stay healthy stay safe and continue loving the game. I'm saying